So I'll start by saying that um, this is not my first time in China, but I'm always, <laughs> always happy to come back. So I'm very grateful to Professor Jia Qingguo for inviting me um, and to speak in such distinguished company. Um, so this is how I'm going to outline my talk. I'm actually not using PowerPoint, so I'm just going to tell you how the talk is outlined, and then I'll get into it. So I'm going to talk about my project, because this is actually a talk that stems from a project that I'm doing that I started last year. Um, I'll talk about my two cases, which is China today and uh, the United States when it was a rising power. Um, I'm going to talk about why this matters, the big question of why on earth should we care, and um, how does this fit into this panel? Why is it uh, a new type of great power relations, or is it new part type of great power relations? What does it have to say? Um, so I'm going to start with just a very, very short history of my project. I started this project last year. So I um, knew that in China, there is a lot of ideas and a lot of discourse and a lot of debate about what it means for China to rise. And when I saw this, I thought, OK, what's the other rising power doing? The other rising power being India today. And so I went back to India, and I did all of these interviews uh, at you know, literally like the top, top um, levels of government in foreign policy decision making. And I found that India is not talking about its rise. It doesn't really have long-term strategy. It's very uncomfortable with this label that it's a rising power. So I came back. This was last summer 2012. I came back in fall. I came to Beda. I um, you know, did a talk in Beda on, on India. And then I went back to the United States, and I published it. Um, and it came out in Foreign Affairs earlier this year. And then I thought, OK, so I know that India is not talking about its rise. So, so what is China saying? And so I spent the summer in Beijing and Shanghai. I was here this summer. And I talked to um, a lot of people um, who matter. Um, in China, and I tried to categorize what the ideas are that are floating around in China today about China rising. And so this is part of an ongoing project because I'm comparing China to a historic baseline. I thought, okay, so China is talking about its rise. So historically, what did a rising power do? Right? And so one of the parts of the project that I'm now focusing on is the United States in the period 1890 to 1913 to see what the United States was doing when it was a rising power. And this is actually a part of even a greater project, because eventually I plan to look at Japan as a rising power between 1860 and 1905 to see what was Japan saying. What do rising powers say? What do they say when they're rising? What do they say domestically? What do they say internationally? So I'm going to discuss, I'm going to do a flip, because I know that when we talk about China and the United States, we usually talk about um, the United States first, and then we compare China to the United States. But I'm going to talk about China first, and I'm going to compare China, uh, the United States to China rather than the other way around. In the China case, I'm not going to talk about it at length, because I think most people here know the debates that are taking place in China. Basically, the main argument I'm making is that in China today, there is a very active inflow of ideas right, into foreign policy. Whether you talk about intellectuals at the university, whether you talk about think tanks that matter, right, or whether you talk about the foreign ministry um, and government think tanks or the top levels of government, there is this massive inflow of ideas. And I wouldn't call it democratic, but it's democratization of ideas in a sense. This doesn't mean that we know which ideas are going to become important. right? We don't even know the pathways necessarily in foreign policy about um, wh by which path does an important idea actually reach the top levels until, for example, you see it. You might see it in a speech. You might see it in an initiative. Until then, you have no idea which idea is going to actually float to the top. However, what the interesting thing is is that these ideas exist, and they're complex, and there are lots and lots of them. So I, when I came to Beijing and Shanghai this year, I did, a, I did interviews. And I did extensive interviews. But by definition, it's not a very big group of people. Because it's a small group of people, really, whose ideas matter. Right? It's not a really large group. And what I found was that institutionally, it's at two levels. So there's the obvious level in which you can see it, which is the leader level. Right? So you know, when you talk about um, President Hu Jintao and, and uh, peaceful rise, He Ping Jue Qi, or you talk about President Xi Jinping and you talk about China Dream, you see it very obviously right, at the leader level. But then you also have it at an elite level. So it's two-pronged. Right? And in this way, it actually manifests itself in two different areas. One area is China's role in the world vis-a-vis -vis the United States. Right? So what does China's rise mean given the United States as um, the established status quo power today? The other way it actually emerges is China's role regionally. 
particularly with regard uh, to disputes that are actually happening, and I think some of them have been mentioned today. And so I started talking to people, and when I actually talk about these ideas, these are not my ideas, these are ideas that, that came up from these interviews, but I'm just categorizing. So if you think about how China actually views its role in the world vis-a-vis -vis the United States, one of the people I talked to said, look, there are five categories, right? So you have the populace, which is dominated by uh, United, you know, by uh, Im uh, which, with, which think that um, the world is today dominated by U.S. imperialists. They say, okay, reach back to Mao strategy. That's how China should face the world. You have the nationalists, who say that look, it's not about Mao, but you have a world that's still divided between the West and the non-West, right? So you have the Western countries and the non-Western countries. So you have civilizational differences. Then you have the realists who are centered on power politics. So they're really not concerned about superiority or inferiority, because at the end of the day, it's just about power politics. And you have the liberalists, who say that, well, you can talk about China rising, but in order to actually raise China's status in the world, you need democratization. Again, not necessarily democracy, but democratization. And you have the internationalists, some of who are actually um, at Beida, who talk about, uh, well, you know, there's no preset destination. You cannot predict how uh, US-China relations is actually going to unfold. It's based on action and reaction. Right? So this is one category of ideas, you know, different types of ideas, but one category of ideas that's basically responding to China's role vis-a-vis -vis the United States. Then you have the second category, which is at a subcategory, right? which is vis-a-vis -vis, um, regional disputes and regional powers. And here, what I found is that there's two main ways of thinking. One is that it's hawkish. You have the hawkish people who say that, look, China um, basically needs to change its long-held policy of avoiding conflict, and it needs to uh, stop maintaining the status quo. Because when it sees countries like Japan and the Philippines, what they think is that they do not have time on their side. Right? They don't want to wait for China to become more, in, uh, become more powerful. So even if China wants to maintain the status quo, it's impossible. It's not going to be able to do it. So it might as well go the hawkish route. And then you have the other category, which is the status quo, which is where they say, look, China needs to stabilize and manage the disputes peacefully. And there is no hurry to do this. Right? So if it can, it should maintain the status quo. And even better, it should try and search for a possible um, you know, peaceful solution. Kind of reaching into these two types of ideas that come up in response to these two types of roles that China is playing in the world as a rising power, you have the Western versus um, Chinese way. So one of the big debates, which is you know, which is that, uh, which pretty much everybody I talked to referred to, said was you know you have the Western path, which is the path that the United States followed to become a rising power, and with China, China needs to find the Chinese path to rise. Right? Um, somebody uh, mentioned to me that. Uh, one of the things that the foreign ministry talked about is to develop think tanks in China which actually have Chinese characteristics, right? So to have Chinese theories of rise, to have Chinese ways of rising. And this is different from how the United States did it. And this kind of touches on the previous categories that I have mentioned. And this is just a fraction of the different ideas that I collected. But to, you know, this is a general category of how these two, path, two types of um, ideas respond to these two types of, of debates on what China's position is. So then I started looking at the United States, right? And the period I focused on was 1890 to 1913. And here I'd like to thank Professor Barry Buzan because he actually made my work much easier. <laughs> because he came out with an excellent article in the Chinese Journal of International Politics in February, which actually compared the United States historically as a power, as a rising power to China today, which meant that I no longer have to spend a lot of time justifying why I'm choosing that period. But uh, what I would like to do is add a couple of more things that I think not, he did not touch on in the article about why this is a, a justifiable comparison. The first is that in this period, 1890 to 1913, um, the United States actually becomes a creditor nation, right? And the United Kingdom becomes a debtor nation. And that's true of China today, vis-a-vis -vis the United States. The second thing that comes up is that the United States, too, was very focused on issues that it was responding to as a rising power. And here's where I'd like to take a step back, 
Because when we talk about rising power, or a power rising, or what it means to be a rising power, you have to understand that this is very, very new terminology. This kind of terminology did not exist in that period. So if you search the New York Times database for 1890 to 1913, you search The Economist, you search any of the US newspapers historically, and these are all available on LexisNexis, um, you will not find that term. Rising power as a term does not exist. OK, this is a modern term. So what does exist? What exists is the United States thinking of itself as a great power. Right? It does not even use the term emerging great power. It just is trying to think of itself as a great power. What you talk about is great power politics. So it's a much more apt term. So you could, if I were to go in today, for example, if I would actually go into Sina.com, and I searched for Zhongguo de Jueqi, Okay, so the rise of China, I'd get thousands of hits. You go in and you search any of those newspapers for the rise of the United States, you get nothing. Not even one, not even one term. However, however, the way to actually look at how the United States thought of itself as a rising power is basically to look at issues that the United States was involved in where it was trying to define its role as a great power. Right? And in that period, there were about four issues. Um, United States involvement in, in Santo Domingo, the Spanish-American War, the Boxer Rebellion, right, and uh, the Algeciras Conference. Right, those were the four issues um, in that period. So I tried to st start tracing what the United States was doing in these issues, right, because that's where the terminology and great power is found. And for this, for this talk, I'm going to focus on one, which is very important, which is the uh, Spanish-American War and the annexation of the Philippines which took place between 1898 and, and um, 1900. The United States annexation of the Philippines led to a bitter, bitter debate about the, about the United States' role in the world. Right? It was a debate where the anti-imperialists in the United States almost won, right? where Philippines could have been returned um, to either Spain or given its independence had they prevailed. And it was divided into these two groups, right? A group called the Mugwumps, who I'm going to explain, and there were dissidents in the Republican Party. Now, you have to understand that today, again, when we talk about China's rise, who do we go to? We go to intellectuals at the university. We go to think tank people, right? There are no think tanks in the United States at this time. So, but yet, there were groups of intellectuals who mattered a lot, right? And these groups you know, were mostly New Englanders, they were, most, they were white men. Um, they were often university presidents, Ivy League university presidents. They were Ivy League educated. They were often came from very rich families or generational families. Um, and they all had massive influence. They held power. So who are the mugwumps? Mugwumps were basically political independents. Right? So they did not, they, they might have sometimes um, run in the Republican Party, sometimes might have, they might have run in the Democrat Party, but they switched sides. And they believed in issues rather than party politics. And then you had dissidents in uh, the Republican Party itself, right, who were anti-imperialists. And you have to understand that this, these two groups were very divided. Right? So the Republicans, the dissident Republicans did not like the Mugwumps. In fact, they hated them. But when it came to the Spanish-American War, they came together. Right. <gasps> OK, five minutes. So 1898 was a turning point, right? So the, the, the first time it was, you know, the Spanish-American War was the first time the United States committed itself to a major role in the international relations of Asia. It was the first time it policed affairs in the Caribbean, and it was the first time it fought war with men of a different race, right? And 1898 to 1900 was when the opposition from the anti-imperialists came. And they were massively opposed to the Treaty of Paris. And the Treaty of Paris destroyed the Spanish colonial empire. It brought Cuba under US supervision. The United States got Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. And so you had people like Carl Schurz, you had people like Andrew Carnegie, Edward Atkinson, George Hoare, who all campaigned for the United States to actually not behave like an imperial power. And why did they do this? They did this because for many reasons. One of the reasons was that US imperialism, they thought, would actually destroy American principles and the US constitutional system. Right? They thought that if the US became a colonial power, it, it would lead to corruption, that there would be problems of integration, race problems, right? that the US, US absolutely could not be undemocratic abroad and continue to be democratic at home. 
Also, there were economic reasons. They thought, look, the trade does not follow the flag. Um, you can actually have economic predominance without colonialism. They were also suspicious of the status quo power. They thought the United Kingdom was actually pushing the US into Asia so it could absolve itself of the responsibilities it had in Asia. What you see is a striking similarity with the, de with the debates in China today. So it's two-pronged. One was the US role vis-a-vis -vis other great powers, right? And the US role in a region. And you see that discourse at leader level, but you also see it at the elite level. So the divisions that come up is, A, in the United States, it wasn't about what other great power, it, the, 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 the idea that was most predominant was that should the US behave as other great powers are behaving? Or, what does the, or should the US behave in an American way? What does the US need to do to be a great power in an American way, right? So it was the UK versus the US. And this was based on certain history. It was based on democratic principles, constitutional government, issues of anti-slavery versus expansionism. And so if you actually see those themes, they're very, very similar to what I found in China today, which is how does the US see itself vis-a-vis uh, -vis the status quo power? How does the US self vis-a-vis -vis a regional dispute? How does the US see itself in terms of rising? Right? Should it behave like the UK? Should it be a colonial power? The United Kingdom was a colonial power. And there are many debates on how the United States should not go that way. So let me get to this last point of how does this matter? And I'm going to finish up really quickly. Which is, one is that history shows us, and I can answer this in Q&A, is that rising powers that actually talk about their changing status become great powers. Those that do not, do not reach that status. The second is that rising powers that actually talk about their rise do so for a domestic and international audience. So it's basically ideas of source of grand strategy. And the last part of this is, I'm not going to tell you that this um, means that there should not be a new type of great power relations or that it's not possible. But ideationally, it's not a new type of great power relations. It's very much an old type of great power relations. And if we actually do that comparison, we can see that how the great power relations more or less remain the same over well over you know, 100 years. I'm going to stop here. Thank you.